editor and she has published fiction and non-fiction for the last 40 years. She's had the pleasure of, uh, privilege of having a short story broadcast on the BBC and uh, other stories have also appeared in various anthologies. She's recently, in 2013, she published a collection of short stories called Strain Mango Branches. Geeta Hariharan, as we know, besides her novels, she's also had a short story uh, collection uh, that was titled The Art of Dying. Her novels include ghosts of Vasu Master, When Dreams Travel, in Times of Siege, and Fugitive uh, Histories. Keki Darwala is best known for his poetry, but he has also had four short story books published. Uh, the Penguin has published uh, some selected short stories untitled Love Across the Salt, uh, salt Desert in uh, 2011. So, uh, Gita Hariharan and Fatima Narayan will be in conversation with uh, KP Narwala. He will probe into the crafting of short stories by Gita and uh, Fatima. somewhat different uh, history. It's looked to different models. But in the other Indian languages, the short story is well learned alive. I edited a collection called A Southern Harvest, translations of stories from the four major South Indian languages. And I was astonished at the riches. Uh, there is uh, while traversing these journals, one also find, finds that uh, sometimes when I started writing, I was writing poetry and I was also writing short stories. And there were at least two occasions 
when I turned a poem into a short story, after writing uh, three quarters of a poem, and I said, this won't do. It will go into a, this should, this should be a short story. Change the language a bit. And uh, it was published in a magazine in press in, in the United States uh, in the 60s. So uh, does that, has that ever happened with you? Uh, Fatima, because you, we must now bring you into the conversation. Yes, I think, because uh, I have written something as a play and found it worked better as a short story and the other way around as well. Written it first as a story and then you see them talking all the time. Okay, that would do well on stage. So, as uh, Geetha says, there's a lot of freedom in the short story form, and especially nowadays. You can go from poetry to to a short story and uh, the other day around. I, can I, can I? Sorry. And, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I said it first, Kate. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, there's, there's a lovely story I have to share with you. Uh, of the wonderful Japanese writer Yasunari Kawabata, whom, if you haven't read, you should hasten to acquire a copy of some of his works. He won the Nobel Prize for a novel called um, uh, uh, Snow Country and in translation. Uh, it began life as a short story and then he wrote a novel out of it. And then later, the last couple of months before he actually committed suicide, he decided to write, he used to write these lovely things, I'm sorry I can't say it in Japanese, I know the phrase, uh, called it Palm of the Hand Stories. You know, the really, the, the fleeting short stories, like a comet. And he turned Snow Country, which was originally a short story, into a Palm of the Hand story and put down his pen. Uh, that would be, wouldn't we call that flash fiction as they call it now? I've seen a lot of youngsters talk about flash fiction. Uh, I still don't know what it is. We, we take a vote. But, uh, for palm of the hand, we, for we will, we will. But if you go to Manto, Sadat Hassan Manto, and see his Sia Hashi, Black Margins, it would be translated as, uh, 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 it's a, what shall I say, a catalog of short stories. And they are really very short, half a page, uh, one third of a page. But <coughs> another, another question, a follow up to Fatima, and that is that. Uh, while you are writing a short story, can you uh, can you start? So suppose you are uh, A and B are talking. Can you write as if you as you write in a play? A A says this. B colon B says this. Why can't we do that in a short story? No, in a short story you want, uh, you don't see them until uh, there is maybe just a word of description or you give them place. So there has to be some geographical pointer, some pointer. The, the dialogue is not just dialogue, because when you have a play, you also have the setting already there. There's a lot that you don't have to say, whereas the characters get to say everything. But in a short story, you have to tell the, the reader where they are, uh, when it is. They're, Costume is not on them. No, that yes. is that I totally agree. You have to do that in the short story. But suppose you are having a conversation. Suppose there are two characters, Gita and Fatima, in a short story, and you say Gita colon Gita says this, so Fatima colon, and Fatima says that. Why can't you do that? Well, some stories are done that way. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. There's like a telephonic conversation. You know, it may work, but I don't think it always works. Not always, but sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't have anything to add to that, except to say that you can use all kinds of narrative strategies. Uh, you could have a story which is in the form of letter, or it could be uh, entirely conversational. Uh, or it could be entirely descriptive and through the mood you get the story. So uh, perhaps, perhaps an example, 
rather than talking uh, like this. Uh, uh, my short stories are early work. And uh, lest you ask why I'm sitting here on stage then, other than the fact that our very nice horse sassed us. Uh, I did recently write another story, one story, because I was asked, and I found myself working quite differently. Those early stories were written after my first novel, and I realized that the novel was taken seriously, so, oh, I do have a writer's life. So these stories became my sort of limbering up exercises. It was like going to the gym and figuring out my agenda as a writer. I was not going to be told, you can only write like this, you can only write from the point of view of a woman, or you can, you know, so I was going to try all kinds of things. So that is when I realized, oh, I can do technique. So some of the troubling questions, how do you write about somebody who actually does not speak English, or someone who's working class, um, you, it's not that you can't. I think a writer should be allowed to write about anything. But because it will sound false, unless you either know about their lives or you show that you are trying to know about their lives, you're traveling to their lives. So I tried to use different techniques. I once used a technique from uh, a, a filmmaking, which we used to call splicing. So you have two narratives and you're really writing two little stories and then you splice it together. Would you like to read a page either of either one? As you can see, we are an astonishingly polite group. <laughs> uh, don't believe it for a minute. Writers are the rudest people in the world. We're only behaving well because we haven't had our dreams yet. <laughs> uh, I, I uh, am going to cheat. Uh, not only uh, do the people here do not have my collection of short stories, but also I want to show that uh, these, these borders and boundaries are really, truly blurred between the novel and the short story and perhaps even poetry. So I'm actually going to read um, a, a, a kind of a, you might quarrel about whether it's a short story, Keki. It's more in the nature of a Teki, but I like that relationship too, the tale and the short story. And this is from a novel called When Dreams Travel, where all kinds of women do all kinds of amazing things. Um, lonely voice sighed. If only, if there was someone with me, I could at least tell stories, but alone? Oh, I see, I'll have to make do with that lizard on the window. With sharp amazement, the great familiar and hanging on to the wall near the window plucked, and there was nothing for her to do but say, in what she hoped was a lizard's voice, all right, tell me a story. Lonely voice then told the lizard, a young woman ripe as a luscious plum with breasts like full pitchers turned upside down was wooed by a virile young man. He came to her and said, come to me and I will satisfy all your desires. She did refuse, but was too frightened to let him touch her. Listen carefully, he told her. I know you'll be in trouble if you take a lover and your people find out. So, a little bit of magic, I know. The child you conceive will be born out of your pretty shell like here. A virgin's life is a lonely one, isn't it? But you'll have a child of love, and you'll be blameless where it matters the most. The young woman agreed and moved towards him shyly. They lived love all night long, said she had a delightful little son out of her ear. Months went by and the woman had another admirer. This one enjoyed her eager but heartless embraces so much that he gave her a slave, an obedient little slave who would be with her as long as she lived. The woman's life became free of all drudgery. The slave did all the boring housework, dressed her and combed her hair and sought the feeding of the child. The next lover, he patiently her next lover was a poet. He sang complicated, image-laden praise to her elbow and the arch of her foot in her virtue. When he tenderly persuaded her to get rid of her clothes and come to bed, he promised her she would turn into a sparkling star when she died. She would be immortal. He 
was so delighted with their night together that he added a more practical gift, a pot that could never be empty of food. A fourth lover was a hermit who was passing by. She was the first woman he had slept with in 150 years, and naturally it was a night he would remember for another 100 more years. The morning after, he said to her, I'm going to give you a special parting gift. Be always what a man desires. His eyes caressed her from head to foot, and the same instant she felt Folds of her skin stretching and tightening, a pull here and a smoothing there, and an extra ounce or two attaching itself onto her breast and hips. What is the best lover's gift the woman received? And I'll take answers afterwards. Oh. <laughs> okay, this is supposed to be a gold collection. So, uh, the, there was a time in Bombay when you couldn't get a drink and they knew where to get their drink and after that the police came. So without the slightest ceremony the other merrymakers fled. And he grabbed his brother's arm and headed for the window of the darkened kitchen. As Lou followed him from the window sill to the drain pipe, his trouser pocket snagged on a loose bracket. By the time they reached the rat-infested gutter two floors below, both brothers had ruined their lounge suits beyond repair. The slime of the pipeline was all over them. Worse awaited them in the gutter, where they hid for the most agonizing ten minutes of their lives. When they heard the police chief drive out of the colony gate, they ran all the way home a full kilometer away. Never did the thought of home seem more desperately welcome. It was a quarter past two. Andy, now quite sober, tapped at the door. There was no sound from within. Lou thought everyone in the building would be glad to receive them, wounded soldiers straight from the war. Before Andy could stop him, he rang the doorbell footsteps. The light above the doorway came on, revealing the details of their condition. Andy had a cut right across his pale forehead. Lou's trouser was torn at the knee, and there was mud all over his shoes, inaugurated for midnight mass on Christmas Eve. Celia, we've come home. Andy's soft voice quavered. The bones squeaked. The door opened just enough to, to show Celia's classic features. She said nothing. She stared coldly at each of the men in turn. Then she shut the door. The bones squeaked. The light above the doorway went off. Celia's footsteps receded. Andy leaned tiredly against the wall. Lou's jaw rose slowly from his red tie. Tell her, Andy, tell her. If she does like that, we will divorce her. We were going on a hunt, but the story is about a person who has lost his son. Lost in the sense that the son has not been seen for about 10 years. And he was formerly using the gun. And he goes with the Nawab and a colonel on the river in a boat. But now he has turned only to photography. And uh, there is a, because the colonel is there, there is a abdar, and he's serving beer or something. Couldn't be beer in the morning, must be tea, and, and the clatter of cutlery on plates. And as they near the island and they are going for a shoot, uh, the birds move off. And we, all of a 
sudden, they saw the whole island rise up in front of them, as if some bird god had summoned the entire waterfowl kingdom to the skies. It was a shock for Sudhakar. Sudhakar is the foot of it. A thousand water birds, Murgab and Kaz, geese, grape and mallard, swamp hen and tern, rising like some gigantic cloud, bird cloud, squawking and screaming and cackling during the winged liftoff. Many of the birds were wet, light shimmered as it alighted on their backs, only to slip off as if it had glanced off shards of galvanized steel. All three of them were stunned by the scene, this vast latticework of wings moving ahead, accompanied by that cacophony of water birds. Then they circled around the island. They have already found a man, sort of a bobo, uh, uh, beard, hair, long, and in tatters. And they, uh, they circle around the island and then they accost him. And they say, Why are you living here? I'll just read two or three lines. Oh, where are you from and why are you living in this island? asked the colonel kindly. Uh, if one, and the man answers, of course, uh, uh, obviously you know now, nobody says he said then, so and so said then, she said then. That's out now. I mean, you read uh, a short story or a novel, uh, that's taken for granted. If one's needs are few, one can live where he wants, uh, he says. Sudhaka was startled. He felt unreal. He didn't know why. But why here, persisted the colonel. Why on this island with the birds? The birds don't trouble me. I don't trouble them. What is your name? What has the name got to do with its side? One lives with the river wind and the river, with bird and fish and with silence, with the seasons and the night. Sudhakar had stood rooted so far. Something touched the memory nerve, the gate, the voice. He staggered a bit and couldn't get the words out of his mouth. The Nawab caught him by the arm, but he gently shook him off and advanced towards the bird man. Sukhdev, he is said, looking intently at the man and advancing towards him, hope shining like two torch lights from his eyes. The bird man's face lit up.
officers in one of those regiments, in the cavalry regiments, you know, and the entire uh, uh, operation uh, of the war, that particular uh, battle and beyond, and how the how horse plots and the masters change, all that comes in one shot. You've done that as well. You've <laughs> written a story from the Trojan horse's point of view. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, the Trojan horse. <laughs> much earlier than these volumes came. Yes, I, uh, incidentally, that also I wrote after a volume of French short stories, which had a story called The Trojan War, and uh, the French can be, you know, very surreal, and this horse comes into a bar and he sits down and he orders a drink and he drinks, and I said, what the hell? I said, surely one can write a better story <laughs> in arrogance. A better story on a Trojan horse, and I wrote the Trojan horse. <laughs> you take up a challenge, everybody. I think surreal is good, especially because we live in a fairly surreal place uh, in India, and many of our stories are indeed surreal. So I think that's the natural condition here. The problem is how to push things so it doesn't get um, what is that uh, phrase I hate? Magical realist. It's a real I can take, but I draw the line at magical realist. Yeah, uh, some uh, some sessions back, uh, it was two days back. This festival has really run for many days. There was this uh, book about life in Goa written by Peter Turk. And he was talking about, there is mention there of some airport strike, the taxi driver strike. And the taxi driver just decided to drive a airport ladder down to Benton. You know those ladders which uh, rise from the ground to the aircraft, the airplane. So he just drove it to Benton. So reality is so much more bizarre and uh, magical. Uh, and when that comes, when that is there in reality, it's hard to beat in fiction. And that's what short story writers keep writing on. You mentioned Kawabata, uh, Yasunari Kawabata. Uh, they are very, very short stories. I'm trying just a page or just one and a half a page. But I found that if you read one of the stories, uh, I had to actually pause, stop, and wait for at least half a day or one day to recover. Really? There would just be. There were just palm of the hand stories. A woman going down to the bath and her husband watches her and that's it. I mean in one and a half page, how much more can you say? But it's written in such a profound and deep way that you need a whole day to recover and you keep thinking, what was it? What? Something resonates in your mind and you spend a whole day trying to figure out what it is that appeals to you. We can take some questions on short stories. I just want to ask, what in your view is the border? What, what in your view is the border between a short story and a novella? Where would you draw the line? Give me only the, the word count. <laughs> <laughs> but as Deepa says, the you hear me? Yeah. yeah. The short story is very, very, very tight. You know, that little bit of uh, extra color and extra shape, maybe that would make it a novella, and not just the volume of words. The, the short story is one thing, whereas the novella would be a bit more. And then you'd have a novel which is many stories. Yes? Well, of course, it's not so neat, but. Uh, I, I, I do agree, but let me let me put it in terms of um, something edible. Uh, I think the short story is a, a plain boiled egg, a humble boiled egg, which is of course like many simple and humble things, very hard to achieve just right. Um, and it 
it's a whole meal. You know, you get all your proteins for the day, and all you need is salt, really, to go with it. But the novella, which is a strange and unhappy and uh, kind of, you know, hybrid is polite, mongrel is more realistic, um, and you will find that when you go to the publisher with the novella. But uh, because you know, won't let you enter. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But you know, the egg, egg image to let you know that I complete my images. Uh, I lived in the Philippines for many years, and they have uh, a delicacy which I try very hard to not eat. Uh, it, it's called balut, and it's an egg which is almost a chicken. And so you just uh, you know chop off the, uh, you slice the top and you suck it in. So it's it's not it's it's an egg, but it's also a chicken. And I think of the novella thus. <laughs> How exactly you define a short story? Is it uh, restricted to the number of pages, or is it something else? How do you define a short story? I really don't think it's a number of pages, and, and actually this is a solid question, I think, because uh, I think a short story, in a way, uh, you, you, you're framing something and it is poised for flight. You know, I think that's, you can do that in a short story. You know, and you almost think when you're finished, and as you described it so well, it took you a few days, it's as if you put it down, and then the text will fly. You will get, it's like eating a very hard nut, you know, that you carry around and then you have to find something to hammer and open and find that, uh, uh, that you know, the kernel to eat. Whereas, um, so there are certain rules of the game, of course. But I think the novel has to, it's not enough. You will find some beautifully written novels that you are, you're waiting and waiting and everything is beautiful and it's set up and you're waiting for the, plane to take off, but like um, Spice Jet or Air, Air India, you know, you're sitting there, you finish the peanuts and the damn thing won't take off. Um, so that is a failed novel. You have to, you know, things have to happen. Multiple narratives have to take place. So my question is not that. My question is, is it restricted to one idea or see a novel consists of various pages and uh, especially a short story? ends with uh, one idea, one uh, episode or something like that. Is it the uh, definition of, uh, is it with one episode or is it like that? A novel is something with various episodes, various uh, acts and things like that. I mean, it's not a number of pages. I wanted to know exactly what, exactly, how do you define a short story? I, I, it, 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 uh, one with a hint of multiplicity and I think the novel is multiple. Uh, I would say that a short story can be one room, one incident, and a novel is a big slice of life. Uh, the, the realistic novel, we are not talking about the magical realism all this. Uh, but I would like to be a little dodgy. All novelists do not write very good short stories. <laughs> Why, for example, take Marquez. I think his novels are, you know, the top of the world. And I can't go through his short stories. The Colonel, you, would you agree? Have you read his short stories? Well, I'm, uh, uh, I, I completely agree with you. Not in, uh, I'm not sure about Marquez, but in, in principle. But the, uh, the reverse is true and more unfortunate. Because publishers want novels, uh, they will say, no, 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 nobody wants short stories, which is rubbish because we all read them. Or there is a new monstrosity uh, uh, that we get, which is the interlinked stories. So uh, somebody's <laughs> got a multiple collection of stories, but they have to interlink it, you know, as if to say the different facets of our lives have to be sort of artificially interlinked. Um, so, uh, but may I add that, you know, while we're talking about this one, it needn't just be one situation and one person and one idea and so on. It can also be the approach that you are only, you know, think of it like a 
filmmaker. So there might be a crowd, there might be a riot, you know, but it's the camera's only got one, you know, so it's one view, I think, also. And hinting always at others. That's another way to look at it. We could argue about it. We were talking, uh, uh, Mr. Kiki Zarawala was talking about Marquez's short stories. Uh, I quite have enjoyed them. Uh, more as a kind of a test, I handed them over to my daughter who was in school. Uh, she read uh, one of his novels and she was quite taken up by it. So she comes, she's now become an addict. So she comes to me and says, Papa, give me some more stories to read. So I gave her short stories of Marquez. And after two or three days, she comes back to me, what a fantastic story, the most handsomest sailor in the world, which is one of his stories, and the tale of innocent Arendira. And she comes and expounds to me about the stories in a way that even I hadn't thought of. And that particular story, The Handsomest Sailor in the World, is one of those stories which is written in one sentence. The entire story running to around eight or nine pages is written in one sentence. And that a 10th standard school girl would actually read it, I was quite impressed. I guess we shouldn't underestimate uh, school-going children. They can actually read a Marquez story and grasp it, get the essence of it, and be, uh, you know, amazed by it. So his st short stories do work. On the contrary, I have to confess, I haven't read a complete novel. I totally agree they work, but they are not as great as his novels. That, that's all. I'm, and I'm glad uh, Gita raised this point that publishers want a novel first. This has happened with me as well, uh, and short stories later. We have the answer to Gita's quest uh, gift question left. Which gift was the best? <laughs> so we have to take a poll on it. Yes. yes. Uh, what is that? Can you just tell me again what is that? I remember that last gift very clearly. Uh, yes. We always something that a man desires, a very chauvinistic uh, gift. But how many would abide by that? You say that was the best gift. Uh, Gita, you could tell us about the four other gifts so that we have a choice. Uh, the possibility of having the baby out of your year, yeah. which uh, we will take a separate female poll on whether that's better than the accepted way, the conventional way. Um, then there is uh, the, star, the star. You will become a star after your death. Yes. And the pot, of course, which always has your food. You know. food yes. <laughs> So you have a choice between having your child being born out of your year, leaving your virginity intact, or you have a slave to do all your bidding. Okay, and you've got a pot which is always full of food, feeds you for the rest of your life, or you can be a star after you die. And the fifth is that you will remain always desirable to a man. Actually, the the the, the craft question here is how do we link with oral forms uh, and uh, one of the le uh, legacies we have is the question story. Uh, the question story which teaches you that the question is more important than any answer. This reminds me of a session we had earlier where one of the speakers said, I would love to pose question papers to the students wherein the last question would be Write five questions. Pose five questions, okay. and so that you know how to ask questions, and not always look for the answer. But the asking good questions is a faculty that you must have developed. Uh, yes. Uh, any further questions? I think we will close one of the most delightful sessions that we have had. No, I thought, uh, one, one small query to the panel, since the since the topic was crafting short stories, uh, could you suggest? In the three of you, three good writers of short stories, where people like us who would like to write short stories would read and emulate. Your recommendations. Fatima, I can always say, Kiki Daru, and Gita Haru. There you go, you got three recommendations. <laughs> you choose five more. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you one because I go into the surreal now and then. My short story writer is Borges. 
I was thinking, oh, you stole mine. <laughs> okay, he stole. This is cake. I cake is always with this. Reading. Yeah. So this Borges, I think Italo Calvino must be oh, yes. immediately and worshipped. Um, his short stories of the five senses, sadly he died before he finished all five senses, but they are extraordinary, the ones he has written, uh, the one on taste and the one on smell and so on. Um, uh, I think Mahashweta, uh, sadly many of us have to read in translation, but how to maintain passion throughout that, uh, how to, they're very troubling stories. The stories which are contentious and we can be contentious about, uh, since we're looking so firm there. Um, but Ma Mashweta's stories are predictable, excuse my saying. And I have one more. So I am obviously the most generous writer here. Paul Zakaria, um, again to be read in translation, wonderful, whimsical, quirky stories. In closing, let me uh, come, uh, you know, tell you of a small story you mentioned about Italo Calvino. Italo Calvino had a story called The Bearer of the Trees, where there is this uh, young yeah. baron, yeah. sorry, pronunciation. Baron of the Trees, this young son of this aristocratic family, decides to live in the trees and never touch the ground for the rest of his life. And he does exactly that. And he travels all over the land, just jumping from tree to tree, and everything his uh, food, his bathing, his every, I think even a love life he has but in the trees. Uh, we will have to add one more, uh, this exam paper is getting long, because let them all read it and then argue with you about whether that's a story or a novel. <laughs> yes, yes. What I wanted to add to that was that this concept of living in the tree exists in many places. Damodar Mahoso has written of it in Tsunami Simon. And in Karmana, we had one family which was called the Katandor family. Katandor is a kind of a wild cat because one of the son, civet cat, civet cat, one of the, at one point, someone's grandfather in that family climbed up a coconut tree and remained there for the next two or three days. And he was nicknamed Katandor, which is civet cat. And all his sons, grandsons, and the whole family after that has been always called Katandor, living in the trees. <laughs> Uh, some short stories live with you. I, I have a, I'm not a great admirer of Anita Desai. I'm an admirer. But there is a beautiful story of a person who, of a, I think a, it's a woman or a, I don't know. Uh, she plays the Tanpura and with the great singer. And she or he, the character, is uh, himself or herself, uh, could become a very good singer but it always wants to stay in the background and just strum the tanpura. It has lived with me that story that one should uh, remain in the background and keep a low profile. And one for the road, Vilas Saran. Vilas Saran. With that, we close this session, the last session of the day. Uh, thank you, Vikki Darwala. Thank you, Gita Haran.